Podcast. My name's Cringy, and we've got a uh, chock-a-block show for you tonight, actually. Uh, we've got an interesting mix of games and movies, and then, like, just sort of a cheeky interview as well. We've got reviews coming up later in the show for Splatoon 2 on Switch, and Final Fantasy XII The Zodiac Age on PS4. Um, interesting games, interesting reviews. I'm not going to say both of them are remasters, even though Splatoon 2 to me looks almost one for one, but I don't have a Switch. One day it'll happen. I can dream. Uh, we've also got uh, Oz and Liam talking about the Castlevania animated series, and we've got uh, my interview with Jen Hale, actually. Jennifer Hale, you might recognize as the voice actor for Femshep in Mass Effect, among a whole heap of other things. Um, look forward to all of that later on in the program, but for now, this is the uh, little bit of a chat about the Melbourne International Film Festival. Every year, the Melbourne International Film Festival plays for about two or three weeks, starting in August. Mm. There's a huge range of films. Um, obviously, film festivals can sometimes be fairly intimidating. Lots of art house and documentaries and stuff like that. And, but, but that's the nature of film festivals. You know, you know that going in. And MIF, in some regards, is no exception to that. But I would like to think their spread makes up for any of those inconsistencies. Oh, well, it's not inconsistent. Like, the, the, there is... A certain type of film that only plays at film festivals, and you will get that. It, you know the foreign art house films, the the, the art of cinema. Yeah, they're, 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 they can be very entertaining and good and, and interesting films, but they're they're fairly niche. Yeah. Um, and those films are playing here, but there's also great documentaries that you wouldn't be able to see otherwhere. There's foreign films, including Japanese films, which we we'll get to in a minute. Yeah. There's also like upcoming Hollywood films. Uh, there's you know there's films with Daniel Radcliffe, Michael Fassbender. A whole range of different things, so it's not just really obscure art house. No, and, and it, it is one of those chances to hear those international voices that you wouldn't like. This films from Iran and like Uzbekistan, I think, has on or Kazakhstan or something like that. And so all these these strange films that show these burgeonings. You know, we forget sometimes that this is where cinema got its start. Yeah, we we come from this Hollywood world, so. and we might as well start off with talking what this sort of segment is going to be about, which is the Japanese offering yes. at MIF. Jason. So the main one for me at MIF that are coming up, there's two Mikes. So Takashi Mike is uh, one of Japan's most hard-working directors, one could say. I think he pumps out two or three movies a year, it's which is impressive. pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, He never has an ending, but that's obvious because he only makes them in two months. Um, but all of his stuff, at the very least, is a visual spectacle. Even if, you don't, even if the narrative isn't there, even if the, the characters aren't there, it's always a visual spectacle. There's always something there for you to go... Wow, that was actually really good. Like, it's if you wanted to kind of toe in the water, have a bit of fun, watch something that's kind of bombastic in that from those Japanese ones. That's the pick. So I've watched because I've been reviewing um, films in advance for the uh, Facebook page. Yep. So you can check that out if you want some individual reviews. But I've watched three Japanese films so far. So I've watched In This Tour of the World, right? Yeah, which is an animated film about a young woman um, who. In like 1940s Japan, she's living through the war, isn't she? Living yeah. through the war, living through the bombing, um, decides to get married to this man she's never met before, and move in with um, his family. It's about her finding a place in the world, which is it, which was a problem back then. Yeah, they had a lot of that situation where they moved in with the families to survive. You know, I mean, even um, Madame Butterfly is basically the premise of Madame Butterfly. You know what I mean? Like, and that's going back however long. So there are plenty of of situations where this is it's not a new story but it's an interesting twist on it it is interesting and it is quite slow it is a quite slow moving drama um that's probably not so much for kids just because it's more about this this young woman and her married life not necessarily sex or anything like that but just her finding her place within the family and the the family unit um tokyo idols which is about the about idol, idol culture, culture. In Japan. Jason, how, how did you J- go Jason with, knows a lot about how this. Do, oh, well, how did you go... <laughs> I've, I've got a criminal record to keep clean, thank you. Uh, how did you go with the implication of idol culture? So idol culture is like... It's like pop stars which older, lonely Japanese men basically worship yes. and pay to worship. Um, with and weird, huge, weird sort yeah. of handshake uh, uh, sort of things where they, they get sort of like... It's like it seems like the only sort of physical content yeah. they get, um, and it starts off with it's following like an like a nineteen year old idol. You're like, oh, this is a bit weird, and then the idol's getting younger, and it gets goes from being weird to no, this this side of it is creepy. Yeah. Um, but 
it, it's a documentary about fandom. That's yeah. what it is, and I enjoy those sort of things. And, and, and I think I think it's good sometimes to be challenged by these kind of things, as opposed to just like, oh, we love everything, you know. Like it, it is that case of when is it acceptable to say that this is not on? They kind of skirt around. When is it borderline yeah, slash? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, because obviously, I I think generally for most of those people, it's not. Yeah. But there would definitely be an element. Yeah, but of be. course, and like yeah. in most things, yeah. 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 Uh, and then the final um, Japanese film that I've watched is Hello Goodbye, which is a Japanese art house film. Um, so that that looked really yeah. interesting. I saw it on the list, and I'm like, I wonder if this is going to be my jam because it ticks both boxes. It's art house and it's Japanese. So that's basically like it's about two um, like female teenagers uh, who are sort of opposite ends of the social sp- um, spectrum, who sort of kind of bond and collide when they run into an old lady who's got dementia trying to deliver a, like a, a former love letter a love letter oh, for yeah. former flame and it kind of goes from there and it's, it's, it's an interesting character drama because it, it sounded like a like a unique premise but it sounded like they nailed the nuance of it like I, 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 I was worried that they would struggle with the idea of bringing those two worlds together but it sounds like they've it, it, it's certainly an interesting film I didn't love it um, but I still like enjoyed learning more about the characters as the sort of it was slowly revealed and they slowly sort of opened up to each other. So so what's your next week looking like? So what, what movies are you looking forward to this coming Well, the, the, my favourite film of the festival so far has been I Am Not Your Negro, uh, which is an amazing documentary about the civil rights uh, movement in America, um, voiced by Samuel Jackson, right. who is actually like really understated and passionate. There's no, you know, motherfucker type thing. Um, it's just he's actually really great in it. Um, that's really good. I'm seeing Jungle with Daniel Radcliffe, uh, directed by um, what's his face who did Wolf Creek. Oh, um, um, Greg. Greg, I, I know who you yeah, mean. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So Australia, like, there's Australian films at the festival as well, which is yeah. which is great because um, we we don't really get cinema releases on them yeah. anymore. Um, so there's lots of stuff that I'm pretty excited for. I watched a bunch of docos and I love docos. <laughs> Now, Shaney, it's 2017, there's plenty of games old and new that have come out recently, but mm-hmm. one that has particularly caught our eye, because it's both old and new, Ooh. is Final Fantasy XII The Zodiac Age. Now, this game recently uh, recently came out um, a couple of weeks back, um, and uh, came out many, many moons ago in Japan as uh, the Final Fantasy XII uh, International Zodiac Zodiacs. Job Class System. Um, and the irony is, is that it was, it, never, Asia, it was so. only in Asia, so it was technically it was international by definition, yeah. but not quite. But now we finally have it. There's been mm. a few changes, um, and there's also some familiarities. So, what do you think, Shane? If you haven't touched like a newer version of Final Fantasy, sort of 13 or even of 15, it's going to be something very, very different to you coming from, I guess, you know, nine and further back. It's actually active and also free open world. It's basically almost like an MMO if you played any kind of MMO. It, the system itself is done very, very well, but it was still an experiment back in its time. Mm-hmm, definitely. Um, especially when it comes to the combat system, there's, it seemed to bridge the gap between the limitations of the ATB mm. gauge that we saw in previous games, yeah. um, and then kind of made fights a lot more frantic and dynamic looking, yeah. um, which was further expanded on in games like 13 and 15. Yeah. Um, so it was a very massive transitional time for the series and um, especially with some of the latest changes um, with the Zodiac job class system mm. where um, the game um, in in the previous um, initially released version that we got you know o- over 10 years ago um, kind of restricted characters to just the one job class yeah now, it was very much like you're this person you're supposed to be doing this kind of like role yeah so it had like license boards is the way they knew like leveled mm. up in skills so you had only one license board that you can actually do Whereas the Zodiac system, the Zodiac system is actually basically a whole new class system. So you can actually choose a class to actually, you know, base, have a whole new like license board too. Mm-hmm. The issue with that though is that there's still like character specifications in that one character is very much suited for a role. Yep. Even though maybe you choose to not do it for another role. 
Yeah, I mean, if you take a look at their stats in particular, mm. the writing's kind of on the wall, and it's yeah. not it's not as kind of open ended as say Final Fantasy three or five. Like yeah. they try, um, but you can definitely kind of tell that they wanted to further expand um, the license boards yeah. and the roles and um, and some of the stat bonuses and things like that. But it, it's like at the end of the day, it's like certain characters are certain for particular things. Just just go be a healer. It's just fine. go be a healer. It's yeah, fine. It's like fine. Do, do whatever you want. Yeah. But aside from that, everything from um, the graphical changes. I mean, like the environments seem a lot more sparse than they were before mm. because I mean. We're not in the PlayStation 2 age anymore. Yeah. There's a lot more things you can cover on screen at once. Mm. A lot more resources to deal with. Finally, Vine's abs are fixed. Um, Fran's butt looks a lot more like mm. it pops out a mm. bit more. And mm. Balthia Sama looks a lot more manly. So if you're looking for a graphical update, if you're looking for um, some of the trimmings of the Zodiac job class system, which is definitely... Um, something that you might have missed over the years, considering yeah. Square Enix didn't release it, mm. then I reckon you're going to enjoy the Zodiac Age. There is still some weaknesses to this game. The speed up option is actually a really, really good improvement because the game itself was slow. Makes it look like you're playing like a, a Benny Hill where everyone's just running. That really and really I guess fast. almost like you're actually playing at a speed that you want to be playing at, just because like the battle was always slow and even movement was always slow. So the speed up function is really, really good add on. The music is actually being remastered, so there's a lot of really nice tracks there. If you actually have never touched 12, it's a really good place to jump onto. If you have, and you don't really want to go back to it, I, I wouldn't recommend because it hasn't aged well in like the combat system way. But that said, it's still a very good Final Fantasy game. I'm Jennifer Hale. I'm a voice actress. I do anything. <laughs> I also do on-camera acting as well, but primarily voice, uh, cartoons, video games, you name it. You were saying earlier um, that you have had experience in production. I have. How did that experience translate into being on the other side of the camera? Starting in production was invaluable, as in, you know, in becoming an actress. I, I remember I was working on a movie of the week once and I watched the director and the DP really fretting over a shot and because I'd been behind the scenes I knew that their issue was a framing issue and they didn't want to capture all the stuff up here so I, I very timidly, I was still in my teens, I said, excuse me, why don't we just kneel down? And like, genius! You know, you can solve a lot, you can be a problem solver if you have a background in production because you understand what people are up against. It's like with the, uh, voice acting. When you've used Pro Tools or any recording program and you're, you're going along and you make a mistake and you do a pickup, you're very clear that you need to pause or make a mark of some kind instead of just going, oh, sorry, blah, 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 oh, sorry, blah, blah, blah. That's a nightmare for someone to edit. You go, hold on, and you restart. There's a big space there. It's a big flat line. It's easy to find. So spending time on the other side of the camera or the glass is invaluable. Did that put some of the technical stuff on the back foot? You know, I was never that presumptuous. I was always very polite and probably overly so in, uh, you know, I think I had to learn how to take up space in, in offering my suggestions and things. Yeah. You've worked in various roles, in, in very varied roles previously. Um, what were some of the, the challenges or the experiences in learning how to, to work in different kinds of roles? Yeah, they're, they're all very interesting formats. Um, you know, uh, live performance is its own animal. Woo! I think the most recent stuff of that I've done is, you know, live improv stuff. And that's, that's always just, you know, who knows what the heck's going to happen there. Um, within voice acting itself, there are so many different aspects of it. There's, um, you know, games versus animation. In the games, it's basically a four hour, one person show. And in an animated episode, it's a much smaller workload and we're all sharing it. So that's a whole different animal. And then you go to motion capture, which is, you know, vocally, it's like film and TV now. The acting has evolved to that, that place. But physically, it still has a touch of live theater to it. You still have to make it big enough so that it registers in the volume and it, you really can carry it. You can take up the space you need to take up to make it land. And then when you bump over to something like, whenever I do, um, you know, film and TV, I'm always... I'm always taken aback initially by how much we get done in a day because you might do, you know, a couple pages in a day. If you're really rocking and rolling, you'll do seven, ten. And in animation, it's, you know, 30, you know, 32 pages in two and a half, four hours. And in games, it's a how many telephone books are you getting through. Is it ever frustrating to work with the, the quirks? No, I don't see that. I don't see changing from medium to medium as frustrating. I, it's my job. It's my job to absorb whatever challenges come along and spit out what works for everyone else because everyone else has a massive workload and I'm there to solve problems, make it easier and bring it to life. 
and there's not really room in my world for complaining, you know, or, or having difficulties. That's for me to resolve and get to work. Is that a mindset you've had from very early on? Well, probably. I'm very uncomfortable with complaining. I don't. It doesn't accomplish anything. I mean, there's, there's. Ex first, you have to sort of vocalize what's bothering you, and then go fix it. You know, don't get stuck on that same note. It's a very boring song. <laughs> One of the more prominent roles you've. Uh, you've been known for is uh, as Femme Chef in Mass Effect. Have you found coming to consumer shows like this that um, communities or audiences might have pigeonholed you into, into that role? I always push against being put into any single box. I don't like being pigeonholed. I mean, however, I'm super grateful to Mass Effect and to, the, to all the wonderful things that came with it. Breaking the glass ceiling, getting Femme Chef on the box, having a uh, vehicle for so many female gamers and male gamers to enjoy the strength of a powerful female character. That's incredible. And I'm pretty persistent with, you know, the other stuff, the crazy roles, the wacky stuff, the cartoon stuff I get to do. I think my single favorite thing about my career is the diversity that I get to have. That's that's really my favorite thing. With Mass Effect, you spoke about um, getting Femme Shep on the box. And at the time, there was a shift towards um, female representation in games that was meaningful and that was positive. Have we made as, as many or as, as big a jump in the time since? You know, it's a great question. I think, I think it doesn't look like this. I think it looks like this. Progress always looks like that. And the fact that the conversation's out there and demand is out there and people are asking the question means that it's just a matter of time before it goes pop and it's there. And look at Wonder Woman. I mean, that was tremendous. It's happening everywhere. And it's been coming for a long time. When I first started, when I first moved to Los Angeles and I was auditioning for commercials, I would get a copy, um, I think you guys call it a brief here, um, and they would ask for, you know, woman number two, woman number three, an announcer. And I would ask my agents, who's doing the announcer? Can I read for that? And, oh, they want a man. And I'd say, can I read for it anyway? And I would just press them and I would read for it anyway so much of the time. And eventually we broke through and women are now all over them. What are some of the uh, the ambitions um, in the future that you're still chasing? I I love uh, I love all of it. I mean, I'd like to add some more live action, especially sci-fi. Love sci-fi. Anything I can um, sing and ride a horse and uh, you know have a great time with great people. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> all right then. Thank you so much for your time, Jen. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. We've just got a brand new Castlevania animated series on Netflix. You're a big Castlevania fan. I guess you must Tell me a little bit about your in the sort of involvement in the game series and this TV show. So I've played all the games as far as I know. Um, maybe not the patches lot ones. But I've... <laughs> yeah, so this game's... This move, this anime series is based on the um, third game of the series that came out on the NES, Dracula's Curse. Okay. Now... So I haven't played any of the games. I've just sort of been around it, you know, make, helping making the show. Um, but it is very much about... It starts off with Dracula, his um, involvement in the human world, how he interacts and moulds it, and then sort of becomes a more of a shadowy figure and we introduce to other characters after that. Yeah, such as um, iconic Belmonts, who are a monster-fighting um, family of long lineage um, through the history of the Castlevania world. Um, so Trevor's introduced in the second episode and there's a couple of other characters introduced in the third and the, the fourth. I, I think you don't need to have played in the games. Um, this is, uh, so the anime series is written by Warren Ellis who's a great comic book writer. He does a very good job of introducing you to the characters in the world uh, while doing you know, quite funny jokes and, and some nice moments. But for fans of the games... Yeah, there's a lot of fan service if you look for it. Um, there's there's a moment where Dracula teleports away in a column of flame, and that's how it, he operates in boss fights. There's a, um, a few other moments in the in the movie, in the series where it really you know ah oh, I remember that from the game ah oh, you know there's a character that only uses fire and ice as spells, and that character that that's all he does. So yeah. It's really well done. Now, we have been seeing movie quite a bit. Originally, this was going to be a standalone oh, yeah. movie in like 2007. Got stuck in development hell and came out as a Netflix original series. Uh, the first season is four episodes, uh, about half an hour each. They have confirmed season two is coming. 
which is going to be eight episodes, which is exciting. I'm definitely looking forward to it. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to hopefully them getting the license to use some of the original music from the games because this series doesn't have the same musical impact as the games do. And the games like Symphony of the Night, Rondo of Blood, they play on that music being a part, integral part of the game. And I'd like to see some of that music being licensed for the second season. Yeah, I think my only real interaction with the Castlevania music is like from the video games live event. Yeah. Um, but that didn't bother me so much. And one thing I have been hearing about it, um, this series, is people talking about the animations and the faces being a bit woody. Um, but I never really noticed it too much or it never really dragged me away from the story. Yeah, and the animation scenes during the fights are really well done, well, really fluid and um, brilliant to watch. Yeah, there's lots of cool stuff with whips and different weapons um, and backgrounds are all really cool. Um, but I would definitely recommend this Castlevania series whether you're a sort of hardcore fan of the games okay. or you're, you know, not like me. It's good to have more games on the Switch, but multiplayer focused ones, now that's a bit of a catch. So thankfully the console was still nice and fresh and with Splatoon 2 finally hitting stores and us playing a fair amount of the game online and offline, we've got ourselves a pretty good idea. Is it fresh or is it not fresh? Some parts of it are definitely, it's a good analogy for it there because it's a return for Splatoon. It was very popular on the Wii U and it was a game that I loved. I'm a little bit biased because I just love the first game so much. I played a lot of it. The gameplay mechanics are something that just blew me away. So it's like a typical third person shooter, but the mechanics, as you can see, there's a lot of spraying ink. You're the squid, you're the kid, and that's the core of it. You don't actually win the game by shooting people, by getting kills. You win the game by spreading ink. And the game main aim mechanic is to spread as much ink and if you cover the map. It's kind of like competitive colouring in. But one of the main things to overlook is that the ink also works as cover. You can swim into the ink, you can duck under the ink, you and can move faster than ink. Using Climb ink. ink. So you shoot ink up the walls, on the roofs, you can dash all around the place. And it creates a really interesting, really, uh, it's got a lot of depth, basically. Yeah, definitely. And it's not just like swimming around either. There's a lot of things involved. And I guess the game does a really good job at explaining it to you. Like, I mean, it, it has the tutorial at the start, but the game kind of forces you into just this, this whole dynamic of painting around, creating territory or marking your territory as well. And um, the more territory you mark, the more successful and the better you are at, at, at the particular game, the more advantage you have in certain areas and creating bottlenecks and, um, and areas in which your opponents are disadvantaged. Now, um, the single player does a really good job at um, teaching you certain mechanics and certain tricks um, in order to move faster, get to your objectives and being a lot more formidable against your opponents. Um, and I think the single player is generally pretty good. I mean, plot-wise, it's not exactly the best, but everything from boss design and the way the universe is created um, and having returning characters like um, Marie and other characters we will not spoil um, is generally quite nice. Uh, and of course, there's the, the in-between now. There's the new Salmon Run mode, looking at what's new at the moment. There's a couple of new things. There's a new weapon. There's yep. new maps. But of course, there's the new mode, Salmon Run. It's kind of like a horde mode. You yeah, can play so with a few of your friends. Very similar to that of horde mode, um, cooperative, being able to jump jump in and jump out of gameplay. Um, very, very fun. Um, kind of, uh, it, I guess it makes the best of uh, voice chat as well, um, which which generally works pretty well. Whether voice on... chat. Do we want to bring up the topic of voice okay, chat let's here? let's bring up voice chat. So Nintendo have launched their new smartphone app. This is their solution to voice chat. Now, this is primarily a multiplayer game. You kind of want to play with your friends. You want to play in a party. Nintendo, they've kind of dropped the ball a bit with the online features in a few ways. It's a bit unfortunate. A few of the problems that were in Splatoon 1, I'd call them problems, are still here. First of all, voice chat, you can kind of excuse it. Nintendo have basically gone, look, we know you, all your friends are sitting there in Discord, in Skype, in Facebook, whatever. We know you can do your own voice chat. It's lazy, it sucks a bit, but we can get around it. We can just jump in Discord and voice mm. chat that way. That's fine. What the real problem is, is when you go to play with friends, the Nintendo matchmaking online features are really substandard for a game that's primarily online focused. Definitely. We found most of the time when we group in groups of two, three or four, whatever our composition was with friends, it was just random as to what mm. team we were being put on. Playlists definitely do need a hell of a lot of work, um, but that can easily be patched out and patched in, um, depending on depending on what's uh, what's required and what is worked on. But like. I guess we can agree that um, all the problems are out actually outside of the game. The game itself is fun, it's fantastic. All the issues on the back can easily be patched out and patched in as you please. But as far as, far as that, the game is still great. Definitely give it a crack. And remember guys, don't get cooked, stay on the hook. That was awful. And that wraps it up for this week on the show. Thank you so much for watching this evening. Uh, if you want to keep up with New Game Plus between now and next week, when we're going to be on 
C31, again, of course. Uh, you can check us out on Facebook and Twitter. We are at New Game Plus TV on Twitter and New Game Plus TV on Facebook. If you want to see more video stuff from us, you can go to our Twitch channel at twitch.tv slash New Game Plus TV. We stream pretty regularly, actually. Uh, if you want to see old videos of ours, or actually new ones, most of this stuff went up to YouTube before I went on TV, you can check out youtube.com slash New Game Plus TV and, of course, the website at newgameplus.tv. But for now, uh, that's all from me. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you soon.